Hey guys, so Jason Matthew here from Trinidad and Tobago and welcome to the Biochem GM YouTube channel. So today we're going to be looking at gluconeogenesis part 3. So yes, that means there's a part 1 as well as there's a part 2. So please go and look at the videos for part 1 and part 2 before you do part 3. Now we look at the first bypass reaction in gluconeogenesis part 2 and the enzymes that, by, that, that were involved in that first bypass reaction was pyruvic carboxylase and PPCK. PPCK stands for phosphenopyruvic carboxykinase. Those two enzymes were used to bypass the glycolytic enzyme pyruvate kinase. All right? So all of the details of that was discussed in part two. So please go to, to part two if you want to get those details. Okay, so this is the second bypass reaction. And the second bypass reaction, we are going to reverse so we are converting fructose 1,6-bisphosphate to fructose 6-phosphate. Alright? And the enzyme that is catalyzing this reaction in gluconeogenesis is fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. So let's recap. In glycolysis, you would have converted fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. And what was the enzyme in glycolysis that you did to do that reaction? We go from this to this. That's right. It was called PFK1. Well, in the reverse um, direction, or when you're going in gluconeogenesis and you're converting fructose 1,6-bisphosphate to fructose 6-phosphate, we are going to be using the gluconeogenic enzyme fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. Now, look at what's happening here. We are converting fructose 1,6-bisphosphate to fructose 6-phosphate. Now, if we were to just do the simple reversal, of the PFK1 reaction. Now remember in PFK1 reaction in glycolysis, you would have consumed ATP. Alright? When you converted fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate in glycolysis, you would, have, you would have consumed one molecule of ATP, the PFK1 reaction. Right? So if we just did the exact reversal of that, it would mean that we would want to make we would have we would make an ATP molecule. Well, the cell doesn't want to do that. All right, that tends to be very um, you know a lot of energy is going to be required for, to do something like that. All right, and you might say, well, well, but at least it's making ATP. Isn't that a good thing? Well, you have to ask yourself where this is happening. It's happening in the liver, and although during fasting the rest of the body might be low on triphosphates. The liver is rich in triphosphates. And the reason for that is that the liver is a smart guy. He doesn't really depend on glucose. He actually, his preferred fuel is actually fat. So he's burning a lot of fat, fatty acids. And he's getting a, so there's a lot of triphosphates already there in the system. So the liver doesn't want any more triphosphates. So instead of doing that kind of energetically unfavorable reaction, and to make this ATP, it does something that is much more energetically favorable and much simpler. So all that this fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase will do is just going to come at the end and clip off one of that phosphate group. It's going to clip off the phosphate group on at the end. So you get you go from fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, you clip off one of those phosphates at the end, which could be either one or six when you look at it, right? But it, Let's say for argument's sake, you clip off the one at carbon one, and boom, you are left with fructose six phosphate. Very simple reaction. Instead of going through all that uh, magic into trying to to make ATP and so on, it simply will come at the end and by simple hydrolysis, clip off one of the phosphate groups. Fructose one six bisphosphatase does that. It's very simple and it's energetically favorable. Similarly, for the third bypass reaction where you are converting glucose 6-phosphate to glucose all right, in gluconeogenesis. The enzyme that we use will be glucose 6-phosphatase. All right, so glucose 6-phosphatase is the enzyme when you are converting glucose 6-phosphate to glucose. This is in gluconeogenesis. And again, it's the same concept. In glycolysis, you would have used hexokinase to convert glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. In other words, going in the reverse direction. And by converting glucose to glucose 6-phosphate in glycolysis, 
that hexokinase reaction consumed one ATP molecule. If we were to just do the exact reversal of that for gluconeogenesis, we will make an ATP molecule. As I said before, the liver is already rich in triphosphates. It doesn't want to go through all that trouble. I already have that. Thank you very much. I don't need any more triphosphates. I'll do a simpler reaction. The simpler reaction will be glucose 6-phosphatase. And just as in the second bypass reaction, all it does is that this glucose 6-phosphatase enzyme is going to come and clip off that phosphate. Simple, easy peasy. High, simple hydrolysis reaction. Boom. That phosphate comes off as inorganic phosphate and you have free glucose. And that's the end of there. It's excellent. It's simple, nice and sweet. So, let's recap. So, we're looking at all the, the reactions in gluconeogenesis. And the question is, well, how many triose phosphates are needed to convert two molecules of pyruvate to one molecule of glucose? So, for every two molecules of pyruvate being converted to one molecule of glucose, how many triose phosphates are needed? Well, for every pyruvate molecule that enter the bypass, the first bypass reaction, we used one ATP and one GTP. So because there are two pyruvate molecules coming in, that's two ATP, two GTP. All right. Now, as you go up the ladder, <coughs> there's an enzyme. So, oh, and there's something to say. If an enzyme in glycolysis makes ATP, then in gluconeogenesis, if we go in a reverse reaction, it's going to consume ATP. And if you watch, we bypass three enzymes. We bypass hexokinase, PFK1, and pyruvikinase. Pyruvikinase was one of the enzymes in glycolysis that would have made ATP. But there was another enzyme in glycolysis that made ATP that is common in both glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. I'm not going to give you that name. Please go and check it up if you don't know. But the reaction that enzyme catalyzed would have been, well, we are looking at gluconeogenesis in the reverse direction, is now 3 phosphoglycerate. And I see that I spelled 3 phosphoglycerate wrong, so please correct that. All right, they should have an E there. So converting 3 phosphoglycerate to 1 3 base phosphoglycerate. Now, for every molecule of 3 phosphoglycerate to 1 3 base phosphoglycerate, we're going to consume 1 ATP molecule. But because it's, it's 2 pyruvates going up, you're going to get 2. So, this 2 in brackets means that there are 2 molecules of 3 phosphoglycerate being converted to 2 molecules of 1 3 base phosphoglycerate. So, therefore, 2 ATPs are consumed. So, in total, now you have 4 ATP plus 2 GTP. And if you're talking about triose phosphates, that's six triose phosphates. So the conclusion here, guys, is that gluconeogenesis is very energetically costly. All right? Because if you think about in, in glycolysis, we have a net gain of two triose phosphate. But in gluconeogenesis, we have a consumption of six triose phosphates. A lot of energy there, people. So as I said, Gluconeogenesis is energetically costly. To convert one molecule of glucose to two molecules of pyruvate in glycolysis, two triose phosphates in the form of ATP will consume. In gluconeogenesis, to convert two molecules of pyruvate to one molecule of glucose, six triose phosphates are required. Four ATP and two GTP makes, makes up that six triose phosphate that is being consumed. So it is a very energetically costly process, but as we saw in part one, it is a necessary pathway. Right? It is the it is the way in which the brain and the erythrocytes get this glucose. Right? We need to maintain blood glucose levels, or bad things will happen. All right. So the question now is, well, where does the liver get all this energy from? And as I said in, in the other previous parts is that the liver uses fat as an energy source. All right, so let's see how it does that. So we have an adipocyte, and as you should know before adipocytes, these are fat cells, they, they store fat, all right? So they store triglycerides. So adipocytes, they store triglycerides. Now, when needed, 
uh, a lipase called hormone sensitive lipase is going to hydrolyze these ester bonds in the triglyceride to give rise to fatty acids and glycerol. Those fatty acids and glycerol are going to enter the bloodstream and travel to the liver. All right. So the fatty acids and glycerol that was produced from the hormone sensitive lipase breaking down the, the triglycerides, they go to the liver. All right. So the glycerol and the fatty acids have a role to play in gluconeogenesis. The glycerol, all right, is a glucogenic precursor. We looked at that in part one. So please go to, to that video if you if you're a little rusty. There are two um, reactions you need to know that brings glycerol into gluconeogenesis. So glycerol is a glucogenic precursor. So and what happens to the fatty acids? Well, there's a process that we haven't discussed as yet, but when we do lipid metabolism, there's a process called beta oxidation that breaks down these fatty acids. And the two products will be acetyl-CoA and ATP. And look how wonderful the system is. The acetyl-CoA is a positive activator for pyruvic carboxylase. And pyruvic carboxylase is one of the enzymes in the first bypass reaction of gluconeogenesis. So we are, we are activating the process. Uh, well, obviously, the ATP is needed because gluconeogenesis is an energetically costly process. So you see how wonderful uh, when everything works, how it, how it goes down, right? Biochemistry, wonderful stuff. All right, so this is the overall process there. All right, so beta oxidation of fatty acids is fueling gluconeogenesis because gluconeogenesis is a very energetically costly process. And the way how the liver gets this energy is from breaking down fatty acids, beta oxidation. So guys, I hope you, you know a little bit more about gluconeogenesis. Please like the video if it was useful. Subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't. You know, send your comments. Tell me how these videos are affecting you in terms of in exams, in school, and so on. Our international brothers and sisters, please guys. Send us a little email, send us a little comment on YouTube. Tell us how these videos are affecting your biochemistry in your country. We'd love to hear, the, get some feedback, all right? And as usual, you know, thank you for all the comments. Thank you for all the support. It's because of that we make more videos, all right? And, and more videos coming soon, guys. So take care and we'll talk soon enough. Bye-bye.